Now then, now then, Smash Bros MMA UK as per back with it for your weekly podcast talking about this week's fights, last week's card, a bit of news, usual suspects here, K Digga Jimbo Slice, how are we doing today? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Good, thank you on this uh, early morning. Quite a bit, yeah, it's, it is early and I'm pretty tired. Uh, quite a bit to get through this week, got been quite a lot of news going off this, throughout the week, a lot of heartbreaking news that we'll get into shortly, uh, you know, relatively straightforward card to break down from last week and then a really good pay-per-view for me this week and you look at a lot of the fights on that main card um you know throughout the card to be fair a lot of them could quite comfortably these days be a main event of a fight of a fight night so uh, we'll we'll get straight into it with the news and for me one of the bigger bits of news this week but a heartbreaking news if you ask me because this this geese is one of my favorite fighters but Anthony Johnson and UFC unable to come to terms and now looking like he's going to Bellator. What are your thoughts on this, Jimbo? I know you're an advocate of Rumble. Um, I, to be honest, I was, I was incredibly surprised, uh, especially when, was it last year, we talked about him re-entering the USAR testing pool. It really threw me that he, uh, he's off to Bellator. And especially at light heavyweight, I thought he'd be up in heavyweight. The uh, light heavyweight division in Bellator has had a, a few recent signings with Corey Anderson and not not recent but Phil Davis is up there they've uh, um, Vadim Nenkov is their champion isn't it um, he's already a pretty stacked division I thought get someone into heavyweight get a bit of name value in there get that get it known but um, I, I'm a bit gutted because he's not going to be fighting the best he's a young he's younger than Tony Ferguson who's fighting in the co-main this weekend he's 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 not particularly old but I think he's, if he's going to make that move Bellator might be the right place for him to go, yeah. especially with uh, yeah. UFC generic cuts. I know. It's it, it's devastating stuff, and you've already touched upon a few of the kind of bigger fighters within that light heavyweight division at Bellator. You've got Bader, who just lost the title to Nemkov. You've got Corey Anderson, Phil Davies, Liam McGeer is still knocking about. Um, K Digger, do you think that Rumble can make a splash in the Bellator light heavyweight division? Yeah, I think he's got a much better chance than he would do in the UFC uh, division, in the UFC light heavyweight division. Even though I think they are, I think there are beatable opponents in in both divisions. Really, I think uh, light heavyweight at the moment isn't what it used to be, and I think I'd, um, that Johnson can uh, can make a splash in in both of which whichever one he went to. But obviously, the UFC just wouldn't. They, they just couldn't come to terms, so it's uh, it's one of those. Maybe maybe you can just absolutely ruin everyone in Bellator, and the UFC have no dis- uh, no no choice but to try and bring him back. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it, and when when you break down that division, you know, some of the main players over there, you've got Bader, who was just champion, who's just lost his title, and uh, who Johnson demolished in about ninety seconds when they fought back in. Um, I think it was 2016 they fought. It were a Fox card back in the day. You Bader tried to take him down, failed. Johnson got on top of him and just pulverised him, and it were it were brutal. You know, if he can do that to the man who's just been the champion, I think the only for me the only person that gives him any real trouble in that light heavyweight division is Nemkov because he's a bit of an unknown commodity at the moment. He's a bit unproven against some of the top elite, and it's just a question of whether or not Johnson can go over there and get it done. I mean, if he wins that. Light heavyweight strap. If Bader's still the heavyweight champ, I don't see why he wouldn't go for the the champ champ status at Bellator. It's a great signing for him. Obviously, I'm a bit disappointed. I wanted you know him to prove his mental metal against a lot of the people in this division over at the UFC. So a lot of fights. The game's changed since he was last there with a lot of different contenders and you know a real lack at the moment of grapplers, which was always his kryptonite. So I think it's a shame. I think it have made waves in the UFC, but you know these things happen, don't they? We've just got to got to deal with it. Whilst we're talking about Bellator, Aliyah Ali McFarlane uh, fought. She was the flyweight champion. She was fighting over the weekend, well on Thursday, and she's lost. You know what? Do you think Jimbo Slice that the Bellator flyweight division? Is, is improved drastically and that's why she's lost. I think mean, they've just got a good contender who's been up to the challenge. I think it's uh, I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. I think uh, flyweight MMA for women is coming along in a bit oh, of a... Yeah. Not, not leaps and bounds, but across the board, I think it's improving. 
And I think there was a bit of um, a bit of Ronda Rousey sort of levels when you you're ahead of the game, and then people catch up, and you lose. I can't remember. Didn't she was it was it forty nine forty six? She lost. She lost. And then I think there was a couple of forty eight forty sevens in the fray as well. I'll just have a check now. So yeah, Juliana Velasquez. You know, it was 48, 47, 49, 46, 48, 47. So it, it was competitive. She didn't like get absolutely demolished, but I, I do think that the Bellator's flyweight division has come on a bit, and I think it's come across, come along across the entire board. And I just think she was ahead of the game, and they're catching up. Yeah, I mean the 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 thing for me when flyweight first became a thing in the UFC, I'm just trying to think who did the first fight. It was um, Joanne Calderwood against that bloody Canadian lady. What's she called? Valerie Latiano. And kind of we're, we were at a point originally with the flyweight. So, it, you know, it used to be an established division, you know, when Jessica I was the champion in Bellator back in the day. But at first you kind of had the bigger straw weights having a dabble at it. And then yeah. you had the smaller bantam weights moving down. And it didn't really have any people that it belonged to. But now that it's become established within the UFC, I think there's a lot more fighters coming through the ranks. You know, you've got your likes of Caitlin Chikagan, um, who's there. Jessica is still a mainstay in the division. Jennifer Meyer. And I think that the UFC had bringing that division has completely elevated it for everybody else. Um, and it is, you know, I think it's one of the better divisions. I don't think it's as good as strawweight. I think strawweight's my favourite yeah. women's division. Because um, anyone can anyone can win and anyone can lose. They're all very, very technically skilled. Um, but I think... I think it's great for the, the division. I think a change in champion, a change in title holder is always great uh, for the longevity of divisions. Anything you want to add here, K Diggy? Not particularly, mate. Not particularly, mate. Lovely. <laughs> and speaking of long speaking of longevity. Oh, oh nice. Cub Swanson is looking for long term health insurance for MMA fighters across the board. Um Hey, Diggy, what do you make of this? It was yourself that wanted this being brought into the, uh, yeah, the it's news. A, yeah, it's an interesting topic, really. It's um, it's quite big in the UK at the minute with rugby players, with the um, the 2003 Rugby World Cup um, winners. They can't remember the match uh, due to due to head injuries. And it's, it's, it's a big thing over here. So it's interesting that, that Cub, Cub Swanson's also brought it up Um it, it, at, at the moment as well because there is obviously long-term health um, issues in terms of uh, combat combat sports and it does make sense um, to, to sort of keep make sure that they are they are okay because what sometimes these fighters don't have anything once they once they get too old once we discard them as as title contenders once we um, once we just say that they're not good enough then then what what can they do sometimes they they, can, they yeah. just go to rock bottom and um, and they have health issues which can ruin them ruin the rest of their lives so I think it is an important aspect um, or or even if it's not long-term health insurance it's just giving them that that financial support um, in the long run to um, to keep them supported for well, for the rest of the years really I think <laughs> I, I agree with it and I don't because, yeah, like you say, you know, when you look at someone like Diego Sanchez, you know, who, for my money, is going to be one of the rosters that gets cut um, during this crop that's coming up. He's a man that is showing signs of concussions and consistent head injuries in the way that he talks and in being an absolute nutter in all seriousness. You know, for someone like him, what's he going to do when he retires? You know, what what... And, you know, has he been smart with his money? Have they been stable? I mean, the pay is not that good, you know, across the board. But I think the question comes that if you're going to do this for fighters, at, at what point does it become an option for them? Because if you had someone who literally, like, came in and had one fight in the UFC and got caught, like, should they get it? Should it be the top boys? Should it be the main players? And I think it's it, it's interesting. I mean, Jimbo Slice, what, what, what do you make of all this? What, what are your thoughts? I think I'm going to go back to the age old argument of what before long term health insurance, what we should be looking at before that is we should be looking at it goes back to a big issue that's going on in WWE at the moment is the uh, unionization of uh, oh, yeah. of fighting combat sport athletes. Whatever your opinion on 
Are they doing a reunion, Isaac? No, there's a there's a bigger bigger play since uh, Zelina Vega was cut, and she, uh, hours before she was cut, she said, uh, "I support unionization of fighters and and uh, wrestlers," and then she was cut six or so hours later. Oh. Um, and yeah, not good luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, I think there should be some sort of unionization for all combat sport athletes and chuck in pro wrestlers as well there and then you can get then you can when you have the union you can then use that for some sort of better pay health insurance but if you've got the better pay you can pay for health insurance if you've it's all comes back to that they probably deserve to be paid a bit more than a big mac really which is what they're getting paid sometimes and money for a big mac and a and a nice bottle of wine when they're at home that's the Need to be paid a bit more than that if they're putting their lives on the line. Um, well, we could we could quite easily do a full video on this because there's the class action lawsuit that's going through at the moment uh, with some of the old fighters. It's been going on for about five six years now, and they, they had quite a big win this week. And I think they're saying that any fighter that was on the roster between 2010 and like 2017 or something like that is entitled um, to be named in this lawsuit. And pretty much what the argument is, it's. Like you're saying, it's about unionisation, the UFC are monopolising the game because I think that it's something like of the profits and revenues that the UFC make, only 19% of it goes to the fighters. Um, whereas you look at NBA, you look at NFL, the other major sports in America, it's 50-50. And the reason it's 50-50 is because of unions. Um, well, I think the problem comes in unionization it's i think it needs to be done you know and they can get things like the alley act in play and things like that for mma the question that comes for it is when you've got fighters who are at the top of the game someone like conor mcgregor you know making millions and millions and millions from the ufc sponsorship endorsements what does he have to gain from unionizing you know to assist a fighter like say cron gracie or something like that you know what i mean and I think until the fighters can get past that individuality of the game and, you know, for the greater good, um, I don't think it'll happen, but it should do. Anyway, we'll sit and talk about this all day. Yeah. We'll move on. I, we'll, move, we'll, move, think, we'll move on. Yeah. And speaking of, you know, what happens to fighters at the end of the game, Matt Wyman is retired following his, you know, his brutal loss at the weekend. We'll talk about this now instead of in the recap, but basically, Jordan, leave it picked him up, threw him on his head and killed him. That, that's kind of how it happened. Um, you know, one of the most brutal knockouts I've seen in a fair old while. Um, Jimbo Slice, what did you make of it? I'll firstly cover on the knockout. I was I was, um, I was shocked. It was... Uh, yeah, it, it, I was a bit... I, I was very concerned for him at first. Very concerned horrible. for him. I was. He looked, um, like he, he looked like he were dead. Yeah. No. Exactly. Like, I didn't want to say that, but yeah, he did. Um, he, he, from what I remember, he did, did, didn't he leave under his own power from the the octagon though, which is quite impressive. From don't think don't think they uh, they stretched him. No, but I can't um, Matt Wyman, this is what his third fight since twenty twelve. Um, you, you forget. No, you forget. The 2014. You forget he's been with the UFC for so long. He's been there since what 2008. Um, end of a career, put on entertaining fights for lots of us. 2006. But I think it. Wow, well, that's a lot earlier than I thought. But he put he's put on entertaining fights. Never got to the top top, but he's 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 fought some big boys. He fought he fought um, Mac Danzig twice. Um, TJ Grant, by Jim Miller, he's he's been up there with some of the uh, the decent guys, the good guys. He uh, he's always been entertaining, and I just I um, sad to see him go. Sad to see him go, but at the end of his career like that, going out like that, you don't want to put yourself at risk again. No. Just having a look now. Just having a quick look at his record. TJ Grant, whatever happened to him? Didn't he get concussions and never could fight again? Yeah, yeah, he went to fight Anthony. No, we went to fight Benson Anderson for the title. One who banged his head, and he's never fought since. Unbelievable, unbelievable, and 
We got anything that you want to add here, KD? Are we cracking on? No, it was a, it was an incredible slam. I think it's it's one of the best we've seen. Well, best slam I've seen for a long, long time. I think it's, it, it was better than the Andrage, uh, Thug Rose slam, and just the way he, he just he uh, carried him over to his corner like um, like Kamzat, but then just fin- finished him in in twenty two seconds. It was it was an incredible finish. Really fair play to uh, Jordan Levitt. Yeah, no, it was. It was it was it was brutal. Whenever you see anything like that, the first thing you think is, "Oh my God, are they all right?" Because it's that that trauma to the back of the head, going to give them concussions, and you know. But you know, aesthetically, they are very nice and they are nice to look at. But they are horrible. Um, big fight, you know, rumored in the middleweight division for March of this year. Interim title fight between Paulo Costa and Robert Whitaker. Um, but they said why it's an interim title fight. It's I would I would assume it's because Jan Blahovic will be fighting Israel Adesanya. I thought he was fighting Glover now. Like what what are they doing? What, <laughs> yeah, why, it's, it's all rumours at the minute, isn't it? Like Adesanya's looking yeah. to move here, there, and everywhere, and and it's it's just he's he's just going to have a crazy twenty twenty one. So I think they're just trying to get a little bit of solidity in the in the um in the middleweight division but it, as i say it's all rumors at the minute so it's supposed to be going on in march i believe they want um yeah that's what they said okay so it's we'll just see when when they get to it as i say it's just uh whispers at the moment but it's going to be an incredible incredible fight um, and <laughs> obviously both have got the losses against um adesanya the king of the middleweights but um yeah these two are, are the the, the top two dogs there and this is why we love the UFC because they put the, the best against the best uh, if this was boxing Costa would be fighting some scrub um, and Whitaker would be fighting, be fighting Kevin Holland <laughs> oh, <laughs> see about that Kevin Holland Kevin Holland will be fighting the winner of these two down the line at some point I think the the thing for me is a great fight. It's a compelling matchup. It's one that you love to see for five rounds. But the thing that just infuriates me so much with the UFC and the matchmaking is just their insistence on bringing in interim titles for no real reason. Israel Adesanya is the champion. Yeah, fair copy. Might be moving up to like every way to challenge for that. But that isn't a reason to completely bring an interim title into the fold. Like, there's no point. We know that he's the champion. We know he's not going anywhere. You know, it mean it means nothing. The interim title means nothing when it when it's brought out so regularly. Like when Khabib, you know, he'd, he'd be fighting once a year, and to decide the next contender, they just put an interim title fight on, and it's like it's just meaningless, absolutely meaningless. And if it is that, I hope whoever wins does a gate and just chucks it on the floor because it means fuck all. However, it is a great fight. I'll just see it going down, Jim Boss flies. Well. I, I'm I'm infuriated by this fight. I'm infuriated by the the top five of the middleweight division. Really, there's it looks like Robert Whitaker is just that step above everyone else, but not as good as um, Israel Adesanya. It looks like uh, the heavyweight division when it was back when JDS could beat everyone but couldn't beat Cain Velasquez. It feels like it's that again. It feels like we've got a man who's better than everyone else, but he can't take the last bit. And if if Paolo Costa who fought Israel Adesanya turns up, I feel like this is going to be a, a, a quick night yeah. for Whitaker. But if the Paolo Costa who fought Uriah Hall turns up, I feel like it's a 50-50, 50-50 shot. Um, and Paolo could walk away with it. And going to your interim, interim title issue, I, my issue with it is I think there should be a limit. I think they should say, like, after 365 days... You can you can have a three no you you there is a, an opportunity for an interim title fight but there shouldn't be yeah. one before that after a year then we can put after if you've not fought for a year and are not planning to fight in the next few months interim title fight it just infuriates me I mean I'm doing a lot of slagging off of the UFC today and I actually feel quite bad for it I mean Dana if you're one of our two <laughs> listeners I'm sorry um, but it just infuriates me like people don't. Just make it a five round. People aren't asked if it's a title fight or not. It means nothing. It's just completely meaningless. But in terms of the fight itself, you've got, you know, a bull 
in the form of Costa coming out to play, going to be going for Whitaker. I think he's going to want to come out there and you know prove his doubters wrong. He's going to come out very aggressive after you know the abysmal showing in the Adesanya fight. Um, and I see Whitaker making mincemeat of him. I think he catches him on a counter and knocks him out. Great fight. Could go either way though. Costa could just as easily knock him out. Um, so it's one of those fights that I think is going to be legendary. K Diggy, how do you see it playing out? I see it as Robert Whitaker versus Roma, uh, Romero part three. And it'll be, it's going to be absolutely crazy. I think I've got, I've got high, high hopes for this fight. I think it's going to, I'm hoping it is a five rounder just so we can just see, see all, all action on display. I'm, I'm not giving up on Costa yet. I think he's, I think he's going to work hard. He's going to prove his doubt was wrong and uh, he'll come into this fight just all guns blazing. And it's going to be one to remember for the, the middleweight division. Um, I don't want to put a, my stamp on who I think is going to win yet. I'm going to have to, going to, have to delve deep and, and look no, at the, the build up. So we'll, we'll, but no, that's, it's an exciting fight. Yeah. And then another fight that's being announced, I think a bit of a step down for Islam Makachev, but he's fighting, allegedly fighting Drew Dober at USC 259. Um, was meant to fight RDA when Paul Felder stepped in, but Drew Dober is his next opponent. Do you think that that is a step down for him, Jimbo? Well, I, I, even if it's not a step down in competition, which personally I think, I think it is, it's definitely a step down in who he's fighting the rankings. He's, he's, it, yeah. He's not fighting a former champion again. With RDA, he should have pushed for that fight to be rebooked because if he fought RDA and won he'd have on his record I have beaten a former UFC lightweight champion yeah. um, I do think though that it might be to get Makachev back back in into the, the, the swing of things he's been out for, for a while now he'll be like, he'll been out for over a year did he last fight on the um, 242 the Dabi card yeah I think it might, yeah. I think it might have been the, the Khabib Poirier card and the, um, from what I remember with Makachev, he's, he's very good on the ground. He is very good on the ground, but he's surprisingly handy on the feet as well. Yeah. Um, uh, now, I don't think he's as good on the feet as Habib was, it was at the end of his career, but I think he's better than Khabib was at this point in, Mak- in Makachev's career. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think he's as good on the ground as Khabib was at this point in his career now either. Um, but I think it's a good fight. Drew Dober's coming off for a win, victory over Alex Hernandez. Um, he's, he's, he's a slick fighter, but I do think it's a bit of a step down. But whoever wins this is propelling themselves towards that top 10 in the lightweight division in a, a fight, yeah. maybe in the top seven or eight. Yeah, the thing for me with Dober is one of these fighters that's been around for years and years and years. And it seems that now, as he's matured a bit, he's putting his game together. So, in terms of competition, I do think, you know, obviously, RDA is a former champion and he proved, you know, he's still got that ability in the Paul Felder fight. The thing for me with Dober, you know, if, if Makachev loses to Dober, the name value is not there. You know, if you lose to RDA, there's no, there's no issue with losing to RDA. He's a former champion. But if you lose to, you know, lower tier contender, unknown commodity, not really known by the casual fan base, Drew Dober. What, it doesn't look very good for him. And I'm not saying he's going to lose, but, you know... He's got nothing to win. If he does, it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy win, Drew Dober, by any stretch of the imagination. He's a really good fight, a very versatile, very rounded game. Um, and I think it's a great fight on paper. I think it's got a lot of potential to be, a, you know, a, a bit of a barn burner. But it just makes you wonder, and I'll come to you with this one, K Diggy, what have the UFC got planned for RDA? If they're not having him fight Makachev, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think I, I don't think Mickey you Chandler. Can, you can't you, get, you can't um, propel him too high, really. I think after 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 beating Felder on five days notice with with him having no training and, and no nothing, and now and then he's calling out Conor McGregor. Like, keep your pants on, RDA. Yeah, I think I think a Michael Chandler would would make sense for 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 both sides. I think RDA is a very winnable fight for for Chandler, and um, I think it would it would start him off in I think it'd start him off in the right place in the UFC. I don't yeah. want to I don't want to see him against Tony Ferguson. 
or, or anyone too high of, of, of that stretch. I think I think RDA would be a, a, a good starting point for him. So I think uh, yeah. Chandler would be uh, perfect. I think I think that's a good a good matchup as Chandler RDA because you, you've got Chandler obviously he's been in Bellator for a while you know flip flopped a bit you know wins to losses RDA been in the game a while you know perennial contender former champion in the UFC it really will show if he is up to that you know echelon of that top top tier like you say is it right to put him in there with the likes of Gaethje and Ferguson straight out of the gate probably not but I think RDA is a good a good starting point and. Just, just one thing I want to talk about that you know that cracked me up this week. Kevin Lee, um, you know, coming out with some pretty serious thoughts about the future, his future, saying that he believes that Khabib will come out of retirement to fight him. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I don't know if you two saw that, but I couldn't believe it. Um, what a fucking clown! This bloody. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it straightforward. He's deluded. The man, have you seen his? Have you seen his head tattoo that he's got on the back of his head? <laughs> he's seen holes, mate. He's seen holes in the game. It's absolutely hideous. That that man's a clown. I, he just does my Sweden. I'll be quite honest with you. But we'll have a look now. Very briefly, talk about last week's card. The main thing I want to get out straight out of the gate is that I, I again won on the verdict. The best never rest is all I've got to say on that, boys. Um, Jimbo Slice again sitting comfortably at the bottom of the table. Um, there's there's three things that happen in life that you'll be certain of. <laughs> Death, taxes, Jimbo Slice coming last. <laughs> always, always. But I haven't got a right lot to say about this card. It kind of went as expected. No real surprises. Um, aside from all of us, you know, touting Habanson to quite comfortably do Vittori in, it was anything but. Um, you know, a, a good a good scrap back and forth, but Marvin Vittori getting that unanimous nod across the board. Um, where does Vittori go from here for you, boys? Uh, I, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I think Darren Till said he's going to move up to light heavyweight. What he's planning on doing, maybe, possibly not. If he stays at middleweight, Till versus Vittori. That's a good fight. That's that, I'm just going to remind that, myself that. of the rankings now. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It is kind of near. Oh, sorry, mate. Sorry, I was thinking, there's kind of near you can you can throw in there as well, but I think really it's it's Till versus Vittori. That's the fight to make. Yeah, I, I don't know if we if we are propelling Vittori too too quickly. Obviously, Hermanson is a big big fight, and and he did dominate him. He threw with evil intentions. His takedown defense was insane. His head movement was great, uh, but. I think I think we're missing someone here who's who's sort of slipping under the radar at the minute. He's he's got his three he's got his three wins in a row, and I think uh, Derek Brunson against. The sure, Tories. I was about to say I was about to say Derek Brunson. Yeah, I, I was about to say that'd be a good fight. He's he's got he's, yeah he's got the three wins in a row, um, and I think it's it'll be the perfect fight for Vittori after that Brunson fight to really fight the. the the, the top four, top five in that division oh, and, yeah. um, and take it and, and have that opportunity to get that middleweight championship. Uh, Brunson, someone else, and then there's the title shot for him. And, you know, I think that's a great fight. You know, you've got Brunson, who, who is pretty much the perennial gatekeeper. And aside from Costa in recent memory, the, the road to the title exclusively goes through Derek Brunson. All the big boys have beaten him. And you've got to you've got to beat Derek Brunson to get to that next level of contender. You know they tried to throw Edmund Shabazian in there and he just wasn't ready. But you look, Adesanya beat him, Romero beat him, uh, Whitaker's beaten him. A lot of the big boys in the division. Well, I'll say Romero he's gone now, aren't he? But um, you know the road to the title goes through Brunson. I think that's a great fight. To be fair, uh, has Brunson got a fight scheduled at the moment? No. If, no. I'm, I'm sure he does. Let's have a look. I don't believe so. Uh, but then, obviously... I want to say he's fighting Ian Heinish. No. Uh, he, 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 hasn't he already fought the, Ian Heinish? No, Gaston. Yeah, yeah he has on him. Heinish. Um, yeah, no, he hasn't got a fight schedule. I think that's a great fight. And then, obviously, Hermanson losing. Still in the top five, but, you know, barely. Like I said many times in these shows, he's a clown, he's... You know, they call him the Joker for a reason because he is a Joker. He's, you know, he doesn't deserve his high ranking in the division. And Come for on. me, 
for me, the, on, the only real fight that makes sense for him is the winner of Hall Wideman next year. That's, I think, the, you know, it gives him a chance to get a, a good name value victory, but then also a good opportunity for one of those boys to get back up in the rankings. Tell you he should fight. When Kevin Holland beats Jacare Souza, get Holland and Hermanson in there. My boy Kevin Holland will be by the end of 2020. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. It's a good fight. Um, I ain't got a right line else to say about this card. Any of you guys got anything anything that you'd like to add? Um, I just thought because I was watching watching I was one of our fifteen viewers um, last night. I had a quick a quick watch and and I was watching when uh, when Jimbo Slice was talking about Hermanson and him fearing the power punches. And I don't I think he got it absolutely spot on uh, with that. I think yeah. uh, he, he he looks he looks a bit shaky in there. He got knocked down, and um, and yeah, I think I think Jimbo just got it got it spot on with that. They don't call us the hard cars for a reason. They call us the hard cars and you the casual, mate, because <laughs> we've studied the game. We've watched the game for years. We sit there at uni breaking down, you know, cards from top to bottom, you know, years ago, years mm-hmm. ago. And I'd scoff in his face if he ever got, you know, some stats, some key stats about the likes of Leo Machida wrong and wins that he and losses that he'd had in the, in the UFC. Uh, because we'd sit there and discuss it and just break down the most obscure fights. We know this business. I do I train, do I fuck? But I can sit here and I'm like, I'm like the Luke Thomas of, of uh, British MMA. I know fuck all, neither does Jimbo. I couldn't fight, but... Um, I'll say what I want to say. And we got, do you know what? This fa- this card coming up this weekend, 256. What a fucking card. Just looking at it now. There's some unbelievable fights on here. Um, Easy to say at one get. point, Easy it looked quite we'll middling. I think we're still on still on this uh, this other card, aren't we? What, what Has anyone got out what they want to say about it? I thought yeah. we were done. I, I, no, you, I just you want to have that. <laughs> I, I want to mention uh, two things. Uh, I want to mention uh, thank you for throwing the uh, good old Leo Machida wins and loss reference, Mister Mister Big Dog there. Um, but also, I, uh, I OSP. What he's gone. He's off in it. What's he doing? You know. Yeah, he's off in this in this sixty fighter call. You know, he's he's a good name to get rid of. You know, he's been in the game long enough that he gets a decent paycheck and doesn't really, I wouldn't say he doesn't deserve it because I do like OSP. You know, he always, win or lose, he goes out on his shield. He goes out swinging. Um, for me, his, de- his best days have passed him. Yeah, yeah. I, agree. I, I agree. It was, it was a, a good performance from Hill. But if you're missing weight and you've, when, he lost against Ben Rothwell in his last fight before. Was it LSP's last fight before this loss against Ben Rothwell? No, no, he's had a fight in the, in between a win, I think. Yeah, yeah, he beat... Um... Oh, yeah, he, 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 he threw a naughty knockout. It was a, it was a walk-off, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but... We spoke about it on here, I think. I think you're right. I think he's off. I think some he's off. Yeah. Mm. And then just the last one, uh, one which I got right actually, and and, and uh, the hardcore fan, um, big dog got wrong. He, he thought um, James was going to beat Benitez, but I think there was a mean knee to the sternum which absolutely crumbled James, and uh, it was great to see. Really, I, I, I it was uh, it's one which made me quite proud, really, because uh, those casuals get some right sometimes. Every now and then, mate. Every now and then. <laughs> anyway, can we move on to this unbelievable card already? I'll allow not it. just because not not just because I need to go off and I need to fuck off and play golf, but because I want to get talking about these fights. Unbelievable card from top to bottom. Um, the more I look at it, the more I think, oh, that's a great fight. That's a great fight. That's a great fight. And you know, a lot of picks today on the verdict. You know, the, there's that many good fights. They couldn't just take it, keep it to five or six or seven. We've got to pick from, and the first one that they're coming out with is. Renato Moicano, Rafael Vizier. I don't even know how to pronounce that one. Vizier, if that's how you say it. I'll I'll take the lead on this one. I'll start off here. You've got Moicano, proven commodity at featherweight. He's moved up now. The weight cut was getting a bit much for him. You've got Vizier, 
you know, last fight was Marjorie Casey, good win, highly touted prospect, a lot of people hot on him, um, but, you know, unproven against that top tier. I'm not saying Mike Carno was, you know, a, you know a, a top contender in the division. He's still unproven at lightweight, but, you know, he's a good player, very rounded skills. I think he takes it down and gets a first round submission, uh, to be honest with you. That's why I think this fight plays out. Okay, Diggy? Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. The the bookies and verdicts have gone different ways. So the verdicts guys are saying Moicano and, um, and the bookies are saying Fizlev. Uh, but for me, I, th- I think um, just the experience in the UFC cage against the likes of sort of Aldo and and the rest of that sort of featherweight division for Moicano, we'll, we'll see him through. Even though he's got his losses, he's got his losses against Ortega, Zombie and Aldo. It's... They're they're the big dogs really in, in the division, so I think um, I think he, he he will see see out his left and get the decision for me. Yeah, Jimbo. Um, now, no, well, I I've actually I've gone I've I've differed from the pack here. I've gone for Fiziev. Um, if this fight stays on the feet, Fiziev's won this in my mind. He, he's he's not just a good MMA striker; he is a good striker. He can he can take people down. He, when he's not take people down as in like take them down he can knock people down he can do this when he dodged Mark Chikasi's kick matrix style in his last fight I just thought you know what this guy's sick um, but it wasn't that long ago when we talked about Moicano possibly being a UFC champion so I do I do feel like I'm I, I might be back in the wrong horse here I, I, I like both these guys I like Moicano um, as a fighter some seems a bit like a bit of a, a strange guy apart from that. Um, but I really, really impressed with his um jujitsu. So if he takes Fiziev down, I think he'll, he'll sub him. But on the feet, I think this is Fiziev's game all day. Yeah, Fiziev is the he's the uh, striking coach for Tiger, Tiger Muay Thai MMA, I believe. So it's he is he is that he has got that um skill set so I can see why why he'd go from it's it's a close fight it really is that's why the bookies and verdicts can't, can't yeah understand. it's it's one of them fights in it where if it goes to the ground it's in Moicano's play pen it's in his arena but if it doesn't it's in Fizio's all day and it's just going to be a case of who can implement their game early and impose their will on the other fighter um. Similar in this one, obviously not to the same, you know, degree of coaching, but you got Cub Swanson against Daniel Pineda. Pineda, bit of a submission expert, you know, he's got 18 submission victories, you know, he's no slouch on the ground. Uh, we'll come, we'll stay with you, Jimbo Slice. How do you see this one playing out? Well, now, was it, I, I've gone for a Cub Swanson decision. This is a man who He's been there and everywhere, but don't get me wrong, so is, so is Daniel Pineda. But um, Cub Swanson's been fighting these top guys for years and years and years. And about this time last year, he had a, he had a great performance out there against uh, Crow and Gracie. Very happy to see that. I know you're, you're only as good as your last performance. I know before, performances before that with uh, Cub Swanson were not, were not brilliant. But also, Cub Swanson is a, he's still a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I know, I know... Pineda just submitted Herbert Burns. But from what I remember, Herbert... OTCK on... Well, Herbert Burns tired himself out. He he came in overweight and he just got knackered. He just couldn't couldn't get the job done. Pineda's coming off... Before that, was he fighting in the PFL? And he's... uh, You got two no contests. Yeah, I said he had a few wins overturned. Yeah. Due to uh, popping for... Popping for certain banned substances... Yeah, testosterone. Um, oh, testosterone. So I'm, I'm, go- I'm gone with the guy, and I know he's fought before that. He fought in the uh, UFC before he was uh, that, and then he went to Bellator. But I've gone with a man who's been consistently fighting top tier talent. This is a man, lest we forget, that was in the ring with Artem Lobov. So I believe Cub Swanson, after sharing the ring with the goat, will get the win. Yeah. It- it, this is a tough fight to call. Very, very tough fight to call. You've got Pineda, who, like you say, coming off an you know, unbelievable performance against Herbert Burns. And I think the question that you've got to ask yourself is, when you look at the odds, he's the favourite. I think Cubs down as a 5-4, to four and he's like an 8-13 to 13 or something like that. So a reasonable favourite. Is that recency bias? You know, when you look at his record, yeah, he is on a pretty good run. But is it a, is it a run of name value? You know what I mean? Is it a run of... 
<clears throat> that Cub Swanson's had. Yeah, Cub Swanson's had a lot of losses in the last couple of years. He's lost to some big boys, but he very rarely loses to anyone um, you know, that's not ranked. It doesn't happen. So for me, I think that the savvy veteran, you know, that like you're saying, that experience in there with the GOAT, that experience with that top tier will be the difference in this fight. And I have him, you know, outlasting Pineda and getting a decision. That's how I see this one playing out. Okay, Diggy, what about you? Yeah, this is the one, well, apart from one which we're going to get to later on, which I had the most difficulty difficulty uh, choosing. Obviously, with Cub Swanson getting the win over um, Cron Gracie, who is the who is the man for Jiu-Jitsu, man, the, the submission artist, the, the, the everything. Um, I, I just wanted to, to push over to Swanson, but then there's the Pineda, who has, who has done so well recently. His, his record's 27 and 13, but those 13 fights were just so long ago where it, it doesn't really it doesn't really take it into account but for me I'm I'm going to I'm going to say even though that Swanson does have his new new motivation training in a new camp and I'm, I'm going to go for Pineda I'm going to I'm going to follow the bookies here and and potentially get some XP with the 2.54 XP on Pineda for submission in the uh, the first round so, but, but there's no there's no clear cut decisions here, and the next fight, I I think I'm probably going to have gone against the curve of you boys here. Uh, we've got JDS fighting Cyril Gan, a great fight. You know, you've got this is this is JDS's last chance in the UFC. If he loses this, he's gone, and he'll know that. So you've got JDS, former champion, veteran of the heavyweight division, three losses on the bounce, coming up against six and zero Cyril Gan. I think that this is. A, a very compelling matchup, and it's going to be a, a question of is it too much too soon for Cyril? And for my money, it is. I think it's a couple of fights too early for him, I'll be really honest with you. Uh, I don't think that he's ready to fight, you know, someone who's been in there with the big boys of the division. And I think that JDS will get a decision here. Um, was this, was this fight to be in a couple of years? I think it would be completely different, but now I don't think that Cyril Gans ready for this level of competition. K Diggy. I'll tell you what, mate. I, I do agree with you a little bit. And if and if that's how you feel, you've got a 10 to 1 odds on Paddy, Paddy Power to for, for a JDS decision. And that that's that's money. It is potential money in the bank. So uh, I've actually put a couple a little bit of money on that. Um but I am I am going towards uh Surugane. Um, he is the favourite here. He's, he's he's looked so good ever since he's started in the UFC. I've just been an avid follower of it. Um, he can he can submit. He's got power. Um, he, he, when he, you, I wouldn't want anyone else just lying on top of me and and ground and pounding me and trying to ground, rip my arm off or rip my leg off. Um, Garnet is a, a hell of a, a hell of a, a hell of a man. Uh, he's six foot five, and I think. Um, I think it is it is time up for JDS, but I can I can definitely see the argument for um, JDS getting the win here. But um, but for me, Garnet is gonna gonna um, gonna win by decision. Jimbo Slice. No, I I I was I was very torn by that. The I, the odds have surprised me that people have been throwing JDS under the bus so quickly as, but. I feel like this is going to go two ways. This is going to go JDS versus someone like when he fought in Ghana and we just watched and cried after he was destroyed. Or it's going to go when JDS fought, someone, fought Derek Lewis not that long ago and he came out and he um, really embarrassed Lewis. But I've gone with uh, I've gone with uh, a Garn victory. Gone with a knockout second round. Um, he's coming off that. It's very similar, I feel like, when JDS fought Rose and Strike. He, um, all he needs, to, at the moment, it seems like all JDS needs to be is touched and go down. Um, so I've, I've gone with the uh, Garn second round knockout, but I, I am wouldn't be surprised at all if JDS comes out and absolutely schools him. It could be a little bit too early. Um, he's coming out, it's, it's uh, over a year layoff, isn't it, for, for Cyril Garn? Yeah. Um, so well, I think it's going to come down to what what's he been doing in that year. Yeah, has he been training? Has he been has he been up in his game, improving his game? If he has, you know, we could be looking at an absolute star 
is Bourne performance here. If not, I think he's in trouble. I agree. That's how I see this fight going. I think it's a really tough one to call because I do love JDS, but he, he, he isn't the man he once was. And we'll start now. We'll stay with you, Jimbo Slice, because we need to balance. We need to balance this one out. Because um, I know what you're going to have gone for, and I know what this joke, this casual is going to have gone for in Kevin Holland against Jacare Souza. Jimbo Slice, how is Jacare going to win? Jacare is going to submit him in the second round. He's, uh, Kevin Holland is long, makes him easier to submit. He's going to arm triangle him in the second round. That's what's going to happen. What He's long, big arms, like easy to manipulate. The only thing is, Holland's got a ridiculous reach advantage at like nine inches he's got on Jacare. But yeah, let's it? not forget, I know Jacare was coming off an unimpressive performance in his last fight, but it was against Jan Blachowicz. It was a boring yeah. fight, but he took him to a split decision. And I'm yeah. hoping he just takes him down and submits him just so this joker can join me in the <laughs> ridiculous pick that I've gone out the window since Brandon Royval lost. I hope he can join me in the ridiculous picks that I've gone out the window. Okay, Diggy, how's Kevin Holland winning this fight? I, I wish I could say it's going to be first round KO, but Souza doesn't get knocked out. He's only been knocked out by Whitaker in the UFC. The rest of them, there's been five decision losses on, um, on his record. So I think we'll make that number six. Kevin Holland, my man, it's the start of a journey to 2021 to be the top 15 pound for pound in the middleweight, baby. Go get him, Kevin Holland. It's, it's it's a tough fight to call this because you've got Jacare coming off two straight losses, you know, to the other joker, Jack Manson, and then, like you say, to Jan Blachowicz in his light heavyweight, de- light heavyweight, I don't think it's his debut, but his light heavyweight UFC debut. Um, I think you've just got a question now, where's Jacare? What's he got left in the tank? You know, it's known to be a tough cut for him to get down to middleweight. And is that going to compromise him at all? You know, he was originally preparing to fight uh, Marvin Vittori, who obviously isn't a really long fighter. And originally I had put, I had put a Jack Array submission, but now that I'm talking about it and I'm, and I'm going, I'm changing my pick to a, a Holland decision. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going for a Holland decision yeah. because I just, <laughs> I think you make points. You know, Jack is not, the best takedown artist in the game. He can struggle to get people to the ground. He's striking slow at the best of times. He packs a punch, but it's slow. You know, is has he got enough in the tank to get Holland hurt and get him down? Do you know, what? I'm changing my pick him up. I'm going. I'm going a step further than UK Diggy. I'm saying a Holland sub knockout in the second round. I thought for a second then you were going to say a Holland submission. I thought you were going to say a Holland submission, but a knockout. I think I think he can win this fight. I think Jacare is going to be compromised by a tough cut, as he always is. Um, he's going to be compromised by preparing for a smaller fighter in Vittore. Um I think he's going to... The, the only real question mark for this one is how compromised is Holland going to be by COVID-19 for my money? You know, because he has he has copped for COVID a couple of weeks ago. Did he have it bad or is he all right? There's only one way to find out, and that's in this fight tonight. Uh, next fight, decent fight against two submission specialists in Mackenzie Dern against Werner Jandiroba. I'll, st- I'll, I'll, I'll start us out here, boys. Mackenzie Dern, I'm hot on. I think in, in, in multiple ways. Um, <laughs> for me, you've got two proven submission specialists here so I don't see this fight playing out on the ground at all because I think both will be too scared to get submitted I think it's going to play out on the feet and I think Dern has got the more advanced strike and I think it'll be a Mackenzie Dern decision in a fight that will be just a park kickboxing match Jimbo Slice where do you go for this one I uh, I sort of agree with what you're saying I, I completely agree that Mackenzie Dern has the much better striking much and from that, I see that leading to a desperation takedown. And Mackenzie Dern, I believe, is a better grappler. And when someone's hurt, easier to submit. When they're down, she will get down, submit her in the second round. From a shot not taken by Dern, she'll, she'll hurt her on the feet. There'll be a panic takedown. She'll end up on bottom. 
If you get a cheeky guillotine or something like that, then. I'm thinking a guillotine, a leg, uh, a leg entanglement, grab the leg, slap, calf slice, or something like that. Again. That's interesting. That's interesting. And uh, K Diggy, is it a sweep for Dern? It's not a sweep for Dern. You need to respect your elders, boys. I think there is um, the the bookies have, have got have got Dern as a favourite, but not a big big favourite. Um, and and verdicts have got have got uh, Jada Roba. I don't know. If I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a four point eight eight XP. So I think it's worth the risk to put the money on Jada Roba. And I believe I've got it as a submission in the second round. I think um, I, th- I think it's going to be a bit closer than, than you guys are, are making out. And I, I'm hoping for um, a fun tussle on the ground um, with a few a few um, submission attempts. But we'll we'll have to see how it goes. But uh, with with the potential to get what is it? I've got 200 XP on it and 4,510 XP coming back on it. I think it's yeah. worth the risk. That's fair. I think. The thing for me, this is either going to be like a fight, like I said, boring, you know, lackluster striking match, or it's going to be fireworks on the ground. I hope we get the fireworks on the ground, but I just can't see it happening. And we'll we'll come straight to you, Jimbo Slice, for the co-main event, you know, arguably the people's main event um, in the form of Charles Oliveira against Tony Ferguson. How do you see this one playing out, Jimbo? <sighs> the, 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 this is, these are the fights that you spend all your way around. Just fights like this. Um, I've um, I've gone back and forth on this multiple times. Um, my heart says Tony, my head says Oliveira. I've gone with my head. I don't I don't want Ferguson to lose. But as they always say, you're only as good as your last performance, and that last performance was lackluster. But I do think Tony's got going to come out with something to prove. Uh, I'm I'm hoping to see some great anaconda attempts from Charles, some dart attempts from Tony. But I feel at the moment, Charles is the type of person who will not be intimidated uh, and will just keep keep pressuring Tony. And Tony will keep going forward as well. But I think Charles Oliveira's weakness is his body. After watching some videos, construct, if Tony invests in the body early, it might, it might pay dividends for Ferguson. But he's, I just want to see the Tony Ferguson for Anthony Pettis fight this Oliveira and whoever wins, I'll be happy with. But I have gone with Oliveira to win. And I believe, I'm just going to check, I believe I have gone with it by a decision. If not, no, I've gone with it by a decision. I've gone with a, uh, a, a, an Oliveira decision. As we, we were discussing it yesterday, uh, Big Dog, briefly, uh, Tony is the notorious slow starter. Well, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You're taking all my content here, mate. You're taking all my content. <laughs> So chill out. I just, I just, just throw like, it you, back you've over. You've been talking for twenty minutes, man. You've been talking for twenty minutes. Leave some, leave some breakdown for the other boys. K Diggy, how do you um, see this one playing out? Yeah, so I think uh, Tony's a slower fight. <laughs> 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 no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same as Jimbo on this one. Um, from from it's been since it's been announced, I've been. Oliveira, Oliveira, Charles Oliveira, Oliveira, Oliveira. Last night, I do my research. I look it up. I look at the faces of all the of all the fighters prior to Justin Gaethje that, that Tony's got in there with, and how he's demolished them. And I envisioned Charles Oliveira's face bruised and battered the way his previous opponents have been. Um, yeah, I think Tony's got surprisingly. Tony's got the height advantage. He's he's six foot to um to Charles Oliveira is five foot ten. Um, Tony's the Tony's the favorite from the bookies. He's the favorite on verdict. So I am going to go Tony Ferguson. And if I, if I if I watch this tomorrow and and think why did you, why are you doing this to yourself, I'm just going to say it's all in the heart because of because of Tony. It's a great fight, and it's one that, like you two, I've been conflicted with for, yeah. since it was first announced. It's a fight that I don't really want to see either man lose um, because I like them both massively. I think they're both great fighters. Um, and the thing for me is, as you've both already said, stealing my thunder, Tony Ferguson is a notoriously slow starter. 
you know, it, it normally takes him around, you know, a round and a half to really implement his game and get going. And whereas you've got Charles Oliveira, who's the opposite of that. He comes out, gets in your face, you know, because, because of his pedigree on the ground, he's not afraid to just throw recklessly on the feet. So he's, you know, very much a kind of technical brawler in the stand-up. And I think that his kind of bull presence in that octagon is going to be too much for Ferguson. I think he's going to knock him out early in the second round. Um, it's going to be a great fight for as long as it goes for. It could go the other way. I won't mind if it goes the other way because the real winners here should be the fans. It's got potential to be fight of the night, if not fight of the year, as far as I'm concerned. And then I'll I'll stay with myself for this one. We've got the main event. We've got Figueredo, you know, headlining back-to-back pay-per-views, coming back, defending his flyweight title against the baby-faced assassin Brandon Moreno. Again, obviously, I've got to stick with my lad because I've, I've you know I've touted him quite highly in the pound-for-pound pound picks for next year. Um, the the thing for me that concerns me for Fig's Fig's fight here is. The turnaround, I think, you know, it's not an easy cut for him to get down to 125, and I'm concerned that he will be compromised by that cut. But I think that he'll do enough. He's, he's got that aggression, that power to come out early and get that, that finish against Moreno. And I think it's going to play out very similar to the Perez fight, but I think the finish won't come till the second round. I've gone for a second round submission. Jimbo Slice, how do you see this one panning out? I... I'm, 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 I've gone against him again. I've gone against Davis and Figueredo. And I think I've, I'll always be doing this until Brandon Royval takes the throne. Um, <laughs> I've got with Brandon Moreno. Um, I, 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 my concern was this is a man who struggles to make flyweight with Davis and Figueredo. It's more, I've gone with more picking against Figueredo than picking with Moreno, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm concerned that. Figueredo's a big man. What was it? He 150, he said, when he stepped into the octagon last time. He, um, it's a hard cut for him, and, and he's just done it. When we saw Tony do that, what happened to him? He got beaten up for five rounds by Justin Gaethje. Um, I think what had it happened, needs to happen is Brandon Moreno needs to go in there and just survive the first two rounds. Survive those first two rounds. Make... Make Figueredo work. Don't just try and coast. Make him work. Make him get tired. And then you can implement your game. You're not as good on yeah. the feet as Figueredo, but you're arguably a better grappler as Moreno. So what you need to do is survive those rounds, make him tired, drag it to deep waters. And I've gone with a victory by a decision, but I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a late, late, late submission from Moreno when Figueredo is absolutely knackered. I completely agree with everything you're saying. I completely agree with it. Like I said, I've, I've got to stick with my pound for pound tout, you know, the, my pick for the top five next year. Uh, K Diggy, how do you see this one playing out? Uh, watching watching the face-offs uh, just this morning, last night, Figueredo's got a mean look in his eyes, boys, and he's gone, he's going to do something horrible to Brandon Moreno, and it's going to be in the first round and it's going to be with his hands, and it's going to be with his knees, it's going to be with his elbows, and it's going to be with his feet. He's going to get, he's going to knock him out in the first round. Because he's, he's on, my, he's on my pound for pound as well. And, and this pound for pound list, what I've made is, uh, is set in stone already for twelve months time. So <laughs> it has to happen. I'm sorry, Jimbo. It has to happen. It's a great fight. Do you know what? It, I remember saying, you know, to you lads not so long ago, how, how underwhelmed I was by the um, this card. But the more I look at it, the more the more excited I get. I think it's superb. I think we're in for a treat. Obviously, over here we've got the Anthony Joshua Kubrat Pulev boxing fight, um, United, you know, happening United around ten o'clock. United City Derby. We've got some. We've got some decent. We've got. Some, we've got some decent sport today. But whilst we're on the topic, AJ Pulev, how do you see it playing out, K Diggy? Don't care. Boxing shit. Oh, oh, you're ad. You're ad. <laughs> I play basketball. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But yeah, really good, really good day of sports over here in the UK. And then a really good morning when I wake up and watch it tomorrow. To be fair, I'll wow. see how I feel. I might even stay up. With a, Going on to the AJ fight, I'm still not... I'm, I, 
I'm I'm concerned for AJ. Concerned for him. He's he, Pulev is no gimme. He's it's no gimme fight. AJ should win. But he should seventh should round AJ. I'm That's thinking I'm ninth saying. round AJ. I'm thinking ninth. I think if this fight had happened last year, Pulev would probably win. Um, but he's an old boy. He's, you know he hasn't fought in in a very long time. AJ, he's been training. You know the Fury AJ fights just around the corner. You know big up the Gypsy King. Sorry, Tom, I know you hate boxing. No, uh, no. To be fair, I just don't like AJ really as well. He doesn't hit him. He's on the Google adverts. He's, he's, a, he's, he's, he's a clown, isn't he? He's a clown. <laughs> but I think I think he gets the knockout. I think we could be looking at, you know, a replay of the Povetkin fight where he's, you know, it's quite close and then he just gets a, a, a finish. But I think he'll do enough to get it across the line. You think ninth round, Jimbo? I'm thinking nine. And then I'm thinking he's going to get schooled by the Gypsy King. Of course. Don't get Walking me wrong. Forever. I will. I will end up watching it, but <laughs> I just. I'll just watch it with a with a scowl on my face. I do. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, boys, I'm gonna have to fly because I'm off to play golf. Um, so I will speak to you both tomorrow or later on, and then thank you, viewer, for watching, and we'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>